You may already be familiar with the self-image idea. This is the principle that each of us is controlled by his mental picture of himself. If you've thought much about it, I'm sure you agree that a good self-image is vital to our happiness and to the achievement of our goals in life. But if you aren't yet familiar with this new idea, let me introduce it by quoting my old friend Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who said, The most important psychological discovery of this century is the discovery of the self-image. A person who has high self-esteem accepts responsibility for their life. And a person who accepts a high level of responsibility has high self-esteem. And the very best definition of self-esteem is how much you like yourself. How much you like yourself. How much you like yourself as a parent. How much you like yourself as a sales professional. How much you like yourself as a spouse. How much you like yourself as a man or a woman. How much you like yourself in terms of physical fitness and health. How much you like yourself in terms of your income or your ability to speak or tell jokes or get along well with others. How much you like yourself. And we know that your overall self-concept is an average of your self-concept in all the areas of your life that you consider important. Science and psychology have isolated the one prime cause of success or failure in life. And it is the hidden self-image that every person has. Do you know it controls our life just as certain as our mind controls our heartbeat? Now to remake that hidden self-image for success and fulfillment, to build a winner's image, is to remake our life. If you're wondering what kind of a self-image you have, it's not difficult to figure it out. All that's required is for you to take a look at the various aspects of your life. Take a look at the results you're getting, possibly your relationships, your income, the position you hold at work, the type of business that you're operating with. Take a look at your own personal appearance. These are all the results. They're the outer expression of the inner image. Now, as we alter this inner image, everything outside begins to change. One of the great errors that almost everyone makes is they're attempting to change their income. They're attempting to change their position. They're attempting to change their business. They're attempting to change something outside of themselves without changing what's going on inside. Your self-image is the way you see yourself and the way you think about yourself. It's often called your inner mirror. It determines how you perform on the outside. It's like you look into this mirror before you perform. If you see yourself as an outstanding sales professional, calm, confident, relaxed, positive, highly paid, then when you work and interact with clients, that's how you'll be. If you see yourself new and inexperienced and not knowing enough about your product, then that will come across. But it is what is going on in the inside. And we know with self-image modification, if you change your mental pictures, if you change your mental pictures about yourself, if you begin to visualize and imagine yourself as you would like to be, that mental picture is accepted by your subconscious mind as a blueprint or a command and you act on the outside consistent with the mental picture. Here's a key point. If you have something important coming up, every time you think of it, visualize and imagine yourself calm, confident, relaxed, and the whole situation coming out perfectly. Before you go to bed at night, before an important day, the last thing you think about is you visualize and feed your mind with a picture of yourself performing at your very best. Then your subconscious mind takes that picture into the laboratory and works on it all night long. The next morning, next day, when you get out and you go into that situation, you'll find that you function beautifully. Now here's the last one. It's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth. That is the real challenge. Once you begin to understand your own self-worth, I'm telling you, your life will begin to soar. You can walk out of the darkness into the light. You can walk out of heartbreak into confidence. Understanding your own self-worth. Here's a good phrase to take home. Each of us must understand how valuable all of us are. But here's the second part. All of us must understand how valuable each of us are. Is your contribution valuable to the whole? I'm telling you, without you, the whole is incomplete. I'm telling you, it takes each of us to make all of us. 
each of us with a contribution. Think how powerful we can be if each of us make a better contribution. In fact, John Kennedy said it best. Surely it's the cry of the new Democratic Party. John Kennedy's ancient words. And he said what? Ask for everything and see what you wind up with. No, no, no. John Kennedy said what? Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what? What you can do for your country. I'm asking you to consider yourself valuable enough to make an important contribution to all of us. You make an important contribution to all of us. And then in return, you get to draw from all of us and the gifts that we bring to each of us. That is the power. And if you walk away from here today with that new refined attitude, I'm telling you, you can have whatever you want. You can have the health you want. You can have the income you want. You can have the future you want. Our self-image is our own conception of the sort of person I am. Each of us builds a self-image out of his beliefs about himself. It's unconsciously formed from past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations and triumphs. It determines the way we interpret other people's reactions to us. In short, this mental picture we have of ourselves turns out to be a kind of life-governing device. Now, that's the most significant part of the whole self-image principle, that our mental picture determines our interpretation of everything that goes on about us, our reactions to life and other people, our feelings, thoughts, actions, even our abilities. We are the person we believe ourselves to be, if we're anywhere near normal, and we're consistently that person in everything. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? It's exciting, too, when we realize that our self-image can be changed. If, for one reason or another, we've developed an image that's too limited to permit our achieving maximum results in life, that image can be enlarged, improved. There's one point to keep in mind here, though. We can't outgrow the limits we impose on ourselves. Our thoughts, habits, even our abilities must be those of the person we believe ourselves to be. We can set new limits in place of old ones. But we can't surpass the limits of our current self-image. Before you can turn your fantasy into a fact, you first have to turn it into a theory. And before you can do that, there's a couple of tests that you're going to have to pass. You have to first ask yourself, am I able to do this? Am I actually able to turn my fantasy into a fact? Now, generally, when a person doesn't know how to do something, they say they can't do it. The truth is they can. You and I are capable of doing anything. We are God's greatest creation. We're spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we're able to do anything at all. All things are possible. Our objective is to figure out how, not whether we're able to or not. Confucius said, uh, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. This could be the greatest time you ever live if you control what you focus on, if you find a more empowering meaning, and if you decide to model the actions of those who succeeded before you. It can be the best financial time, the best emotional time, the best spiritual time of your life, but you better take control of your state. And if you think you're going to do it just by today, you're wrong. You're going to need to get yourself some rituals. Right now, every one of you in this room is controlled by your rituals. I don't just mean this one. I mean every morning you get up. I know your body. I can look at your body right now, and I can guess your rituals. Some of you, your rituals to work out five times a week, I can see it clearly. Four to six times a week, it's obvious. Because you couldn't look like that if you didn't do that. Some form of workout. I don't care if it's walking, lifting, whatever. Some of you, it's obvious that lifting weights is part of it. You can see by that man's muscles. I know, I know what his rituals are. Because your life comes from your rituals. If you don't develop the ritual, you're kidding yourself. How many agree with me on this? Raise your hand and say, I. And there are rituals that put you in state, and there are rituals that take you out of state. You have rituals in your relationship. You have rituals with your body. You have rituals around your finances. And the rituals that worked in the reaping time of fall in the markets and in business and in real estate, those rituals won't work now. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, you get pain. I'll say that again. If you do the right, you go, but Tony, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm not being rewarded. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, you don't get rewarded, you get pain. So you better do the right thing at the right time. And to do that, you better know what season you're in. And to do that, you better learn how to change your state, how to take control of your own conditioning. That's what I live for.
You may already be familiar with the self-image idea. This is the principle that each of us is controlled by his mental picture of himself. If you thought much about it, I'm sure you agree that a good self-image is vital to our happiness and to the achievement of our goals in life. But if you aren't yet familiar with this new idea, let me introduce it by quoting my old friend Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who said, The most important psychological discovery of this century is the discovery of the self-image. Our self-image is our own conception of the sort of person I am. Each of us builds a self-image out of his beliefs about himself. It's unconsciously formed from past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations and triumphs. It determines the way we interpret other people's reactions to us. In short, this mental picture we have of ourselves turns out to be a kind of life-governing device. Now, that's the most significant part of the whole self-image principle, that our mental picture determines our interpretation of everything that goes on about us, our reactions to life and other people, our feelings, thoughts, actions, even our abilities. We are the person we believe ourselves to be, if we're anywhere near normal, and we're consistently that person in everything. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? It's exciting, too, when we realize that our self-image can be changed. If, for one reason or another, we've developed an image that's too limited to permit our achieving maximum results in life, that image can be enlarged, improved. There's one point to keep in mind here, though. We can't outgrow the limits we impose on ourselves. Our thoughts, habits, even our abilities must be those of the person we believe ourselves to be. We can set new limits in place of old ones. But we can't surpass the limits of our current self-image. There's a story about a Wisconsin farmer who was walking through his fields one day when he stumbled over a little glass jug in his pumpkin patch. Out of curiosity, he poked a young pumpkin through the neck of the jug, being careful not to break the vine. Then he placed his little experiment back on the ground and walked away. When harvest time came, the farmer was working his way down a row of big ripe pumpkins when he again came upon the glass jug. But this time it looked different. Picking it up, he discovered that the young pumpkin he had poked inside now completely filled its glass prison. Having no more room, it had stopped growing. The farmer broke the jug and held in his hand a runt pumpkin, less than half the size of all the other pumpkins, and exactly the shape of the jug. Well, people aren't pumpkins, but our self-image is something like that jug. It determines the size and kind of person we become. The similarity ends with the fact that we can remove our self-imposed limitations by enlarging our self-image. We form a mental picture of ourselves through experience, and we can change that picture the same way, through experience. If the actual experience we need is not available to us, we can, according to self-image psychology, create that experience synthetically. Now, scientists agree that the human nervous system is incapable of distinguishing between actual experience and the same experience imagined vividly and in complete detail. Worry is a good example of this synthetic experience. When a person worries about something, he projects himself mentally, emotionally, even physically into a situation that hasn't even occurred. The man who worries intensely about, well, say, failure, finds himself experiencing the same reactions that accompany actual failure, feelings of anxiety, inadequacy, and humiliation, and eventually headaches and an upset stomach. As far as his mind and body are concerned, he has failed. And if he worries about it long enough, if he concentrates on failure intensely enough, he will upset himself to the extent that he will fail, and he'll get sick. Now, everything can be used in either of two ways, positively or negatively, constructively or destructively. Worry is the negative use of creative imagination. It's a negative synthetic experience. But most people apparently never realize that positive results, just as real as the negative results of worry, can be achieved through using our imagination constructively. Our minds are complex and marvelous, but like electronic computers, they can only act on the data we feed them. The man who worries about failure is unwittingly defeating himself. He's feeding his mind the wrong data. If he spent the same amount of time visualizing success as he spends thinking about failure, he could reverse the process of synthetic experience. Instead of anxiety, he could develop confidence, self-assurance, poise, and a feeling of well-being would replace apprehension. By concentrating on the success he desires, by synthetically experiencing that success, he can expand his self-image into that of a person for whom success is normal, expected. Why not practice holding the self-image of the person you most want to become? This is the person you can become. If you feel you'd like to enlarge your self-image, 
then I'd like to invite you to join me in some image building. During the next few weeks, listen to this message at least once a day. This way you firmly implant in your mind the concept of the self-image. Use your spare moments to concentrate on your goals and the greater success you seek. Analyze your past successes and formulate ways your success can be increased in the future. While on the way to work, between appointments, while waiting to see a client, these are all excellent times for directing your attention to positive, constructive thoughts. Put more into the positive use of your imagination than you ever put into its negative use, worry. You're merely reversing the same creative process. Now it's working for you instead of against you. Now, since the mind works best when we feed it only one set of instructions, do not worry if you can help it during the course of this exercise. Your creative imagination can enlarge your self-image appreciably in just three weeks, and it will if you just let it. Nobody pokes us into glass prisons beyond which we can't grow, but all too often, almost unknowingly, we set unnecessary limits for ourselves by holding a self-image that's restricted, inadequate for the full realization of our potentialities. Each of us is, at this moment, the product of all his thoughts and experiences and environment up to this point. Through thought, we can control to an almost unbelievable degree both our experience and our environment from here on. Whether or not we choose to direct our own course through life is entirely up to us. The important thing is to know that it can be done. This is Earl Nightingale, and thank you.